Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing part 30, believe it or not, of our uh, Planet Zoo Mods for Lights where we take a lot of bunch of different mods of cool animals that have people been making and talk about them. So I thought we've got something pretty big and pretty special at the back there if you can see in the back there but we won't get them to last because it's big and special but this is going to be a really cool episode. I'm really excited to look through what we've got here. And yeah, I really love making these, and hopefully we get to, I've already got up to part 33 planned, it'd be cool to get up to part 40, even part 50, that's going to be lots of mods and lots of time, but I'm excited to do it with you guys, so let's get into it. So, we're going to be starting off with a mod by Leaf, now you guys can say, oh it's a clone, but it's a really little uh, cool animal that we've got here, so let's find ourselves a nice one chilling that. We have got here, this is a... Hills Ruffed Lima. So this is a subspecies of the black and white Ruffed Lima, Lima uh, Vecina Vangada. So this would be Vencida Vangada Editorum. And you can tell from this guy, because there are three different uh, subspecies of black and white Ruffed Lima. These guys live in the most southern parts of their range, or they're so called, called the southern black and white Ruffed Lima. But you can also tell is that they look like they have this little coat on. You can see, if you look at other rough lemurs, they tend to have different patterns going down here. But these guys look like they have a little coat on, which I think is actually pretty cute. And a pretty interesting way to distinct them, differentiate them from other lemurs. So together with the red rough lemur, which is already in game, they are the largest extent members of the family uh, lemuridae. today. And they range in length from 100 to 220 centimeters long, or 3... 0.3 to 3.9 feet and weigh between 3.1 and 4 kilograms or 6.8 to 9 pounds So you can see they are called a black and white rough lemur because they are black and white as you can see here Even though that does depend on the subspecies and they have these ears that kind of look like rough and they are really really cool So these guys are found in the eastern rainforest of Madagascar and this subspecies is found Furthest towards the south, that's where, if you look at a map, the most southern populations will be uh, the hills Red Rough Lima. And they have a really interesting diet. They have a high um, frugivorous diet, so they eat a lot of fruits that make up to 92% of their overall diet. And smaller percentage of the diet is taken up by leaves, nectar, seeds, and even fungi. And it's also influenced by the seasons, so they'll take different plant species and different fruits different times of the year. And what's really cool about these guys is that they demonstrate this rare behavior of like a female social uh, dominance, both inside and outside of feeding groups. So the females are the boss in their societies, same with like ringtail lemurs and such. So the girls are all males drool kind of thing, I'm sure a lot of feminists would love that. <laughs> but yeah, really, really cool. And one of the ways that they exhibit this dom dominance is feeding purpose. So they're able to, pretty much the female, they explain, uh, establish priority of individuals through uh, feeding. So basically, the reproductive females get the most food because they obviously need it because they are reproducing and producing young. Which is kind of funky, but still cool. And dominance is not thought to be established in young females, so those groups tend to lack a mature female, may not have a dominant female, so they kind of just do their thing. It's very interesting, complex social that the guy, these guys have got going on. And they also have a bunch of different types of calls that they use, and have like chorus of like roars and shrieks that they use to communicate with each other. And while we talk about these guys, let's find ourselves a little baby. Look at this cute little baby. Very, very cute. So, both males and females reach sexual maturity at ages 1.5 to 3 years old, although they don't necessarily breed during the first year of maturity. So you can see here, um, estrus for these guys lasts about 2 to 3 days, and when these guys breed, they have a gestation that lasts about 102 days. Uh, typically, they give birth to a litter of 2 to 6 offspring that are unable to cling to their mother, uh, as in other primates, and they... Build a nest where the infants will remain until they can leave on their own. Oh, what's he doing there? Something invisible. That's a bit weird. <laughs> Still a cute little baby. So the female builds a nest and the infants will stay with the babies for the first two weeks, about nearly 24 hours a day. So the mother's very good and attentive. And look, aren't these guys so cute? I think they're worth protecting. <laughs> so both males and females will guard the nest. And uh, there is evidence that's related to unrelated females will also deposit the infants and communal nests so they all share 
taking care of the babies, which is pretty cool, not gonna lie. But yeah, that's really awesome. But sadly, all three subspecies include of the red, black and white rough lemur are sadly endangered, uh, critically endangered actually, and they have a, had a very steep downwards trend, dropping 80% in 21 years before 2020, uh, the equivalent of three generations. So a lot of these guys are threatened by uh, the human inhabitants, so they're hunted for bush meat. They're also, a lot of their forests that they live in are cut down for agriculture. And the slash and burn is very devastating uh, to their habitat, so they're mainly just habitat loss and hunting. But there have been attempts to reintroduce them into air, different areas, but it's something that's kind of not been enforced, and we really just need to protect the habitats that they live in, because Madagascar has such a unique biota. It's been separated for forever and has all sorts of different cool animals that have evolved separately in Madagascar, so it's really something worth protecting. And aren't these guys cute? I think this guy's very cute and worth protecting. So that was done by Leaf. We're going to be moving on to the next one. This one is by a plastic fork, or just plastic fork. We have got the yellow bellied marmot. So this is a juvenile. We're going to have a look at adult. Look at these wonderful guys. So the yellow bellied. Oh, I just got that. So down. So the yellow bellied marmot, or also known as the rock chuck. These are a very large species of ground squirrel that are in the marmot genus of course and they're one of 14 species of marmot and these guys are native to southwestern canada and the western united states that live in the rocky mountains Sierra nevada and mount rainer in the state of washington so let's let's see you go aren't you cute so these guys have actually a pretty uh high uh, live at pretty high elevations typically about 2000 meters and they usually weigh between 1.6 to 5.2 kilograms so they're very big when fully grown and generally they kind of uh, typically weigh between 3 to 5 kilos and females weigh between 1.6 to 4. And they average about 47 to 68 centimeters in length and have a short tail measuring 13 to 21 centimeters long. So as I mentioned, these guys are found in southwestern Canada and the United States. They have a pretty big range. Uh, I live around the mountains around California and such. They even do live in California technically. Yeah. So they have, live in these high uh, alpine meadows and forests and stuff where they forage for food and such. Look at these wonderful, having a nice dig. So they live in these meadows, foothills, valleys, where they choose to dig burrows under rocks and things to avoid predators. And predators for these guys include animals like uh, foxes, dogs, coyotes, wolves, and eagles. So they have to be very attentive to try and avoid predation. So these guys reproduced about, let's, um, let's, Look at a baby, a very cute baby. So, marmots reproduce about two years of age and may live up to about 15 years. And they reside in these colonies of about 10 to 20 individuals where they each dig a burrow and hibernate. And they start to look for females in the summer. Litters of these guys usually average about three to five offspring per female. And only half of those pups will survive to yearlings, sadly. But they have this harem polygonous mating system where a male reproduces with two to three females at the same time and female offspring to stay with the area where, uh, at their home while male offspring will typically disperse and leave to try and find more females. So yellow belly mama spend about 80% of their lives in their burrows, 60% of which is spent hibernating. So they are spend a lot of time hibernating. So that's why they get in false in the spring where they go to mate and bulk up for hibernation. Pretty, pretty cool though. And their hibernating burrows can be up to five to seven meters deep, which is really, really cool. And the ones that they construct for daily use is usually no more than a meter, where they can use to escape predators and such. So these guys are also diurnal, so they are less active during the night and mainly out during the day. They are omnivore omnivores, but generally prefer a lot of uh, plants, such as the grasses, grains, uh, uh, flowers and legumes, but they also will eat bird eggs and insects and they've actually been known to eat fruit and bark from fruit trees Which is pretty pretty cool and usually their food of choice depends upon the fatty acid and protein concentrations which helps obviously a Protein is a very hard thing to find in plants and so is fat So they go for like the most fattiest most richest plants that they can find plus they got to put on weight for the winter So they got to eat economically try to eat as much as they can and also they don't drink that much water because their plant diet actually mostly serves their water requirements, but they do drink. And luckily they are considered uh, not endangered. They're considered least concerned about the IUCN and there's no threat to their population, but there is 
not really obviously things like habitat degradation can be an issue but they are most of their range is covered by areas that are not really heavily logged or anything so these guys are doing pretty well and i still think they are wonderful let's have a look at another adult look at these guys really wonderful rodent who doesn't love a good rodent so yeah we're going to be moving on to that that was by a plastic fork and now we're going to be moving on by the big duo so this was made by leaf and nicholas line rider as you guys might know his youtube channel i am the line rider we've got a mod that i love this was a mod that i've been always really excited for we have got see these little guys here these are tree uh, pangolins also known as the white-bellied pangolin so they are the most common species of pangolin in africa and they're one of the eight species of pangolin that can be found across asia and africa so these guys are a pretty small pangolin they get between their combined head to body length is about 33 to 43 centimeters with their tail length about being 49 to 62 so they're not very big animals but still very very cute and you can see each scale has three points where well, they get this scientific name uh tricuspis so that means they have three points so tricusp and they are part of the genus uh, Fetagunus, I believe they have to pronounce it. So there are two subspecies recognized of these guys is P. Uh, Fetagus uh, tricuspis tricuspis and tricuspis uh, malabre. But these guys are of a very big range. They range from Guyana through Sierra Leone into much of Western, Af uh, Western Africa to Central Africa, and they actually as far east as places like Southwestern Kenya and Northwestern Tanzania. So they have a very, very big range. And to the south, it extends to Northern Angola and Northwestern Zambia, but also be found in Segal. Uh, they have been found in the uh, Atl Atlantic island of Bikaku, or we best pronounce it, but no records confirm the presence of them in Singal, Gambia, and Guinea-Bissau but it is kind of possible they could be there. So these guys are semi-arboreal and generally nocturnal, so they usually come out at night. They tend to live in these lowland tropical moist forests, as well as savanna forest mosaics. And they can adapt to some degree to habitat modification, as it favors cultivated and fallow land that is not aggressively hunted, so they can survive well in those kind of areas. So you can see here the tree pangolin can walk on all fours and its hind legs, but they also use, kind of like a monkey, they use this long tail here that they use for balance. You can take a big poo for me. Yes, yeah, that's a big poo, buddy. So they can use this long tail that they got here for climbing and holding onto things. And when they walk on all fours, they tend to walk on their front knuckles. So you can see it's almost like an anteater there, which is really, really cool. But they're actually not related to anteaters, they're actually more closely related to carnivorans, so like things like, uh, also, uh, they're kind of like an early group. That's It's really cool, I really like their taxonomy. And they also have an anal scent gland that they use, like a skunk, to send out a dis uh, gross smell that obviously scares away predators. And they also have a gizzard-like stomach, and they don't really produce that much... Um, Stomach acid, they use the acid within the ants to help digest. But they have a gizzard and they fill it with stones as well and sand to help try and digest the ants. And they fill their stomach with air before eating water and the acid to add the buoyancy for well-developed swimming. So tree pangolins eat insects such as ants and termites from the nests or the armies of insects moving on and in trees. They rely on their thick skin as you can see here for protection and they dig into burrows with their long claws. They eat between 5 and 7 ounces of insects a day, or 150 to 200 grams. And they use their long tongue that they have to lick up all these, with their gummy mucus that they use to lick up all these little insects that they love. So female pangolins tend to be solitary and uh, live in their territories, with small territories of about 10 acres. But males have much larger, up to 60 acres, where their range will encompass the ranges of many females let's see if we can find a baby here yes that's an adult there's the baby a very cute baby if i do say so myself so they live uh the male will have his territory will encompass many females so he'll go off and breed with them and the meetings are brief when the females are in estrus where they mate gestation for these guys lasts about 150 days and one young is born per birth Usually, the young pangolin is also carried around on its mother's tail until it's weaned after three months, but will remain with its mother for about uh, five months. So at first, the 
when they're born, their scales are soft, because obviously that would be very painful coming out of the mother. But after a few days, you can see them start to harden. But sadly, these guys are considered endangered. Even though they are relatively common, they are subject to wide uh, exploitation for bushmeat and traditional medicine. And pangolins themselves are the most trafficked species on the planet, so that's a huge risk for them. And have been used for African bush trades. They're also exported to places like uh, Asia for traditional medicines, which do not work. Do not buy pangolin products, ever. And they believe that the species went between uh, 2025 uh, decline between 1993 and 2008 due to the impacts of these bush huntings. But they're, they're really concerned that they've been harvested at really unsustainable levels in some of its range, and they have elevated their concern to pretty much endangered now since it's such a prevalent issue of them being hunted for their uh, scales for medicine. So it's, yeah, it's really, really sad. But how can you how can you not love these guys? Pangolins are great. It's really sad that they're hunted. They're the most trafficked animal on the planet. It's so sad. But look at these wonderful guys. So now we're going to be moving on to moving from pangolins. We're going to be moving on to this was made by Leaf as well. We have got a goat coming up. So this is is that a female? Yeah, that's a female. Where's a male? Here's the male. So this is the long-tailed gorel or the amur gorel, which is an ungulate. These guys are a type of kind of goat and they're found in the eastern and northern Asia including Russia, China and Korea. And the population of species exists uh, in the Korean demilitarized zone near the tracks of the Donbebelu line and the species is classified as endangered in South Korea with a population of no less than 250 but otherwise they are doing pretty well. In 2000 2003, the species is actually reported to be present in northeastern India, which is pretty cool. So these guys uh, prefer high elevations with their rocky, uh, deep cliffs and such, and they make their homes with sparsely vegetated cliffs with small crevices and such. So that's really, really cool. Let's have a look at a female while we're talking about it. Look at these wonderful girls. So the group size is usually about 12, 2 to 12 individuals, where the group consists of females, kids, and younger males, with older males tending to be solitary. And they usually stay within a 100 acre range, and this can be uh, different to males in rut, and males will travel long distances in rut to find as many females as they can fertilize as possible. So these guys also get very similar to goats. They, uh, males can weigh between 62 and 93 pounds. And females, 49 to 77 pounds. They vary, uh, lengths can also vary from 30, 32 to 51 inches or 20 to 31 inches. And they even owed toad ungulates in the goat antelope family. And you can see they've got these really uh, charismatic horns that you can see here with these distinctive rings as such. And let's go back to this female here. Ooh, that's not what we wanted to do. We're going to get out of there. We'll have a look at this female one more talk. So. These guys have a diet of can be skinned of browsers, but they do eat a lot of grasses and woody material, including nuts and fruits. And the summer months, they tend to feed on grass in the mountains. In winter, they browse on these woody twigs and tree and trucks. So they've been known to eat pretty much any plants they can get their uh, mounds around. So the uh, goral's average lifespan in the wild is about 10 to 15 years, and although a captive goral has been known to live for 17 years, the females go into a 30 to 40 hour estrus cycle where they can be fertilized, and at the end of a 215, 15, not 50, just making sure you guys get that, you get a cute little kid. They usually give birth to one offspring, but they can give birth to twins. And they actually have been breeding within zoos, has been pretty successful, which is pretty awesome. So these guys are considered uh, CITES 1, and considered vulnerable, but they are kind of doing okay. The only conservation evidence is bringing to the cavity within the zoo system to make sure they don't go extinct. There is a lot of poaching of wild populations and such. Uh, that's just kind of a thing around the areas where they live. Poaching, uh, agricultural business has not been good to these guys as well as they use the slash and burn technique to clear land for livestock, which obviously means they don't uh, have a good times living in these habitats if they've got to compete with them. They also get hunted by uh, tigers, lions, bears, and... They tend to uh, get in the wayside in zoos, 
but these guys are still really cool. Also, poaching's an issue, but they're, luckily they are considered vulnerable, but they have been considered on the endangered species list. And as long as their population continues to decline, they, they might not have a good future. But they seem to be doing okay at the moment, but there is a steady decline, so there needs to be some serious protections in place to protect them. It's all a wonderful animal, so it'd be ha suck to lose them. So that was done by Leaf. So next one we're going to be going to an animal that we've already done a couple times. So I'll only quickly go through this one. So we've got a really nice mod. This was done by Loaf Hound and Leaf. We ported it. We've got this really nice red fox. So what is a red fox? So the red fox is the largest of the true foxes and is one of the most widely distributed members of the order Carnivora. And they can be found pretty much across the entire northern hemisphere from North America to Europe to Asia, plus parts of Northern Africa, and they're considered least concerned, though have been introduced to Australia and considered one of the worst invasive species in the world there. So these guys uh, originated from small uh, ancestors from Eurasia, and they colonized North America after the Wisconsin glaciation. And although they are true foxes, they are kind of omnivorous. They are pretty... Uh, they are... Kind of to an extent, but they are what you consider hypoviparous, uh, hypo carnivorous. So they don't eat, they eat a variety of other things. So the reason you can tell them they're one of the biggest foxes, and you can tell that they are red foxes because of their red coat that you can see here, which is often a very common point for them, which is really cool. And you can often see individuals that are ludicistic or melanistic with dark colors or patches and stuff. And they usually travel in pairs or small groups consisting of families such as a mated pair or a male with seven females with a kinship tie. I don't know what's up with the uh, thing here. It seems to be the frame rate's got down a bit, but that's okay. So they generally, generally feed on small rodents such as... Uh, they may also take rabbits, squirrels, game birds, reptiles, invertebrates, and young ungulates. And fruit and vegetable matter is sometimes eaten. And also they tend to... Uh, kill smaller predators than themselves but they also get attacked by larger predators such as golden eagles wolves coyotes jackals and eurasian eagle owls along with other large felids so they have also have this really long history with humans they have been extensively hunted for uh as a pest and also a fur bearer so they're often made to make fur coats and have been a very big thing in folklore and things so yeah I've already covered this guy a couple of times, so I don't want to go like over and over and repeat myself. But yeah, a really wonderful animal that we got here. Really, really cute. So I'm not sure what's up with the frame rate, but is it is it these guys? No, it's probably just I don't know what's going on. But we'll be moving on to another nice mammal we got here. So we have got cool 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 guy this was made by leaf and bubbly ones of course uh we have got the american wolverine so this is a subspecies of wolverine there are two subspecies of wolverine there's the american and the kind of asian or eurasian wolverine it's not a really cool animal so these guys are also known as the glutton or the quick hatch so these guys are found in remote boreal forests of northern areas in the enormous hemisphere such as Canada, the US state of Alaska, Europe, and Western Russia and Siberia. So, found in a lot of different areas. So these guys, the, the adult wolverine is probably about the size of a medium-sized dog, with a length usually ranging from 65 to 107 centimeters, with a tail length of 17 to 26 centimeters, and a weight of 55 to, or 5.5 to 25 kilograms, though exceptionally large males have got up to 32 kilograms, which is pretty, pretty cool. And they have this really uh, thick fur that you can see here that is hydrophobic, that makes it resistant to frost. And they also, that's also leading them to be popular with hunters as they use them for with trapping and such, though you don't want to mess with a wolverine. They also have anal scent glands that they use for signaling and marking territory. And they've also earned the name Nasty Cat or the Skunk Bear because of it. So, wolverines are generally scavengers. They pretty much take what they can in terms of carrion. But they can hunt to feed themselves. They've been recording killing prey such as adult deer that are many times larger, uh, that have been many times larger than themselves. Their prey also includes, this is going to be a long list, porcupine squirrels, chipmunks, beavers, marmots, moles, golfers, 
rabbits, voles, mice, rats, shrews, lemmings, caribou, roe duck, whitetail deer, mule deer, sheep, goats, cattle, bison, moose, and elk. So that's pretty cool. And smaller predators uh, are also occasionally preyed on, such as marmots, minks, foxes, lynxes, and weasels, and coyotes, and wolf pups. They and they've also been known to kill Canadian lynx, but generally they kind of do carry in, but they will hunt to obviously get food. So successful males will form lifetime relationships with about two or three females, which they visit occasionally and kind of do their thing, you know. So usually they have a gestation period of about 30 to 50 days where they have litters of typically two to three offspring. We'll have, while we're talking about that, we'll have a look at the baby, such a cute, wonderful baby here that you can see. Um, yeah, that's what they're called, kits, and they're born, so these develop rapidly, they get to adult size in their first year, and they typically live for 15 to 17 years, but in their wild, uh, wild counterparts tend to live for 8 to 10 years, so fathers will make visits to their offspring until they're weaned about 10 weeks of age, and once they reach about 6 months old, some reconnect with their farmers, fathers and travel together for a time, so that's kind of cute. So I mentioned these guys are found all across, uh, Boreal Alpine regions, they're found in northern US, uh, across northern Russia, western Russia, and places like uh, Nordic countries, such as Finland and uh, uh, Scandinavian countries like that, so they're quite common there. And even though the world population is not known, these guys live in low population densities over a large range. They seem to be doing well, I'm pretty sure they are considered... The least concerned, so there's not really any pressing conservation issues that most people think. But obviously, things like deforestation and hunting, if not well uh, managed, could hurt the populations. But they're just very hard to study because they live very, very uh, wide areas with uh, low density, so that makes them hard to study. It looks like a uh, problem's been fixed, so that's good. So next, we're going to be moving on to. We've got some sharks coming up. We've got a really cool shark going on. So this will be. Uh, by Leaf, Genora Pizza, and Archaea. So this was a model that was uh, ported from Endless Ocean 2. We have got, let's see if we can find, it's on the land, but I want to find one on the water. We have got the Greenland Shark. So this is such a cool shark. So the Greenland Shark, also known as the Grey Shark, is a large shark that's related to other sleeper sharks and are found in the Northern Atlantic Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. And what really makes these guys interesting is that they have the longest they have the longest lifespan of any vertebrate, which is estimated between 250 to 500 years. In fact, they do not reach sexual maturity until 150 years old. So, if there was one born in 2000, it wouldn't start breeding until 2250. So that just puts in perspective how long these guys live and how slow they live. And they are a pretty generalist feeder, so they pretty much eat whatever they can. And they uh, have adaption, a really cool adaption they have uh, to living in the deeps. They have a high concentration of trithylamine dioxide in their tissues, which makes their meat toxic, so you can't really eat them. But another thing as well, they're one of the largest sharks. I believe they're like the fourth largest shark. They usually grow between 6.4 meters long and weigh about uh, 1,000 kilograms, but may potentially get up to 7.3 meters and more than 1,400 kilograms. So that's pretty, pretty huge. So these guys are an apex predator. They may mostly eat fish, but they have been observed hunting seals as well, which I think is weird. They're very slow and seals are very fast. But they manage to do it. They've been recorded eating sharks, smaller sharks, skates, eels, heron, uh, kaplan, arctic char, cod, rowfish, scotlands, uh, scotlands, lumpfish, wolffish, and flounders. And they seem to eat squid as well. They've also been re found remains of seals polar bears, moose, and reindeer in their stomachs. In one case, a whole reindeer was found in the stomach of a Greenland shark, which also makes you think, how the hell did it get access to a reindeer? That makes you think really, really weird. When as a thick ectotherm, they have the longest swim uh, speed and tail breed frequency, so it takes a very long time for them. They, they're very slow swimmers. Their fastest cruising speed is about 2.6 kilometers an hour, and because, because this top seed is only half of that of the typical seal of, the diet, of their diet, they, we don't know how they attack faster seals, but they might just ambush them, which is really, really cool. So, as recently as 1957, the females were found not to deposit eggs. I want to find the baby. Where's the baby? There's a baby. 
So it seems like they didn't really deposit eggs, so they must retain embryos within their bodies, so they are born alive. The process is called opovivipary. After a gestation period of estimated 8 to 18 years. So that tells you how long these guys take. About 10 pups are normally born, initially measuring about 38 to 42 centimeters in length. And within the green shark's uterus, Villi serves a key in supplying the oxygen to the embryos. It's also speculated that during the embryonic metabolism with reproduction, they only allow for about 7 to 10, litter size of about 10 pups. And they have been estimated, because of their extreme longevity, they may have up to 200 to 700 pups during their lifetime. So even though they breed only about 10 at a time, and it takes like 20 years for them to give birth, they live so long that they can easily compensate with that, which is really, really cool. So they are toxic with their high uh, concentration and stuff, and their meat is eat if their meat is eaten without pretreatment, they pretty much, uh, you get extreme drunkenness and sometimes die. So you got to be very, very careful with that. Let's find another shark to talk to. Yeah, wonderful animal. So you can actually eat them, but you have to boil them in several changes of water, and you have to ferment them. You basically have to try and get as much of the thiamine, try try my thiamine out as much as possible. And these guys are sadly are very much affected. They've been targeted for their liver oil and try and develop until they develop synthetic oils. Also, their, their biggest threat at the moment is anthropogenic climate change, which is affecting the sea ice, which making it warmer. That can affect these guys. Probably makes it harder for them to hunt seals even. And they get attacked by fishing fleets. And also new fisheries could put them at risk since the Arctic's opening up. It's very possible that these guys could get more and more caught in bycatch, which is very, very terrible considering how uh, so breeding they are. So if one died, it'd be another 150 years until another one is mature enough to replace it, really. So yeah very very cool animal though one of the largest sharks another one that's really great so made by the same people this is by leaf and archaea so that's another port from endless ocean 2. we have got is there any swimming i don't see any swimming i want to see one swimming there we have we've got anomalocaris so this is a really cool extinct animal so their names means unlike other shrimp or abnormal shrimp anomalocaris uh, they're an extinct genus of radiodont or namalacarid that is an order of animals that are thought to be related to ancestral arthropods. So the first discovery of this guy was found in the Opagosa Shale, where they kind of thought they were several. There were thought to be diff several different animals. There was a their mouth was found in a different place, their trunk was found in a different place, and their appendages were found in different places. But it turns out they were all one creature with a. Anomalocaris was named first, so that's why it is called Anomalocaris. A really wonderful animal. So that's why they've been misidentified. And they also got pretty big too. They they were gigantic. They got up to about 38 centimeters long. And there have been previous estimations of one meter, but that is unlikely. But there are other relatives like Ariogocaris that got up to two meters long. So these guys were almost like the big predator, they were the apex predator of the early Cambrian. So these guys came around just at the beginning of the Cambrian with the Cambrian explosion. Here we see a huge diversity in different fossil animals such as these guys. And we see trilobites and things, it's a really wonderful time, the Cambrian. This is where we see animals like this. And yeah, they believe that they had a diet of lots of hard body animals and made it one of the first predators in the world, which is so cool. And they believe to use, they, what they would do is they would take prey, they would use their uh, appendages to drag them to the mouth and use their mouth to break them up and break them apart. So these guys are found in the bird of shales and a bunch of different uh, areas in the Cambrian that were low sea areas, so places like the bird of shales. And there are species that are found in Australia as well, in Emu Bay. So these, as I mentioned, these guys would be... Uh, well, this was evidence in younger places they got to much greater sizes, so they got uh, to big animals. And they were originally believed to be a separate species, so these bigger specimens, uh, Anomalocaris gigantea, but the validity of these species is challenged. But these guys are still really, really cool. And one uh, really cool thing, these guys all suggested by grabbing uh, one one end of their prey and their joys and they use their appendages to drag it up 
and they use they produce stresses that uh, destroy these uh, arthropod cuticles. So that's the places where they bend in the exoskeleton of an arthropod, where it kind of break them apart and allow them to access their innards. So that's how they would have hunted trilobites and things, which is freaking interesting. But that's so cool. I love anomalocarids. Really wonderful group of animals. And also, we're going to last but not least, we have got drum roll, please. We've got the largest animal on the planet, the largest animal ever to exist. This was by Leaf in Arcadia. We have got the blue whale. So a wonderful animal that we've got here. So the blue whale is a marine mammal that is part of the baleen whale family, uh, my city. And the largest uh, individuals, the largest confirmed length of 29.9 meters, with unconfirmed reports of animals up to 33 meters long. And get this. 199 tons that's their largest estimate and it's the largest known animal ever to exist beating all the large sauropods the largest elephant the largest anything so they're the largest living and largest animal ever so they get their name the blue whale you can see they've got this bluish grayish uh, patterning on them such a big wonderful animal so as I mentioned, there's, these guys get huge, they range, different populations have slightly different averages, but they all can get to really big sizes like this. And they've also been estimated the maximum age for a pygmy blue whale, which is a population that's found around Australia and New Zealand. They are kind of the youngest or the smallest of these populations, quote unquote. But their estimated age has been about 73 years, but it's very possible that they could live to 100, 150 years. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Just being the largest animal on the planet, they're very, very criminally understudied. <laughs> and we also know that have been hybridization with these guys. They've been found uh, humpback and blue whale hybrids, which is, for, which is wild. And also fin whale. Fin whales are much more closely related to uh, blue whales anyway. But yeah, so these guys uh, are migrating, so t they tend to live in the uh, Arctic or Antarctica during the winter, where, I mean, during the uh, summer, where they will feed on krill. They pretty much only exclusively feed on krill, where the opening of their jaws is the largest biomechanical event in the world, and they can swallow, like, tons and tons of krill, basically, like, 20 truckloads, I think it is, and they use the baleen, which is, like, a feathery or hairy uh, lining to their mouth, as you can see if they open their mouths. I don't think these ones do, but they have a hairy lining, it's called baleen. They use to filter out water and they keep the krill in the mouth, and then they use their powerful tongue to push it back into their throat. And they actually have a pretty small throat. A blue whale has a throat that's probably, it could probably choke on a loaf of bread. That's how tiny it is. You would think that a big whale has a big throat, but these guys don't have a big throat. Which I think is really wild. But everything else about them is huge. They have a tongue that weighs the same as an elephant. They have a humongous heart that's the size of a, a size of a small car. They have arteries that a child could swim through. Uh, there's just a lot of things that are huge about a blue whale. <laughs> which is really, really awesome. So, these guys reach sexual maturity about 10 years old and an average length of 23.5 meters long for female arctic blue whales and they tend to have no really well defined uh, social structure other than mother calf bonds and they generally travel in small groups or in pair or solitary mainly solitary and there's little known about their breeding behavior so these guys are swimming very very fast but blue whales are very fast swimmers don't get me wrong so female uh, blue whales give birth every two to three years depending on their body condition and lactation and they estimate to give birth about those times uh, 60 percent so one really cool thing about these guys, when they're born, they're born at about 7 meters long and weigh between 2.8 to 3 tons, so that's the size of an elephant. And into 6 to 8 months, that's when they go off to wean, and they already at that size get about 16 meters long. So they, by the time they're 8 months old, they're already the size of a humpback whale, so that is so impressive. And the thing about whale... Uh, milk as well is that it's just so full of fat so these babies have been pretty much turbocharged through growing so they grow so 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 much and you can see how huge they are compared to the people here but there's no direct measuring uh, measurements of height hearing sensitivity in whales but they have known to uh, detect really really low frequencies so they are quite well adapted to communicating with that and sadly 
we're going to go to the threats of these guys. Blue whales have probably been very, are very, very prosecuted. And there are lots of different, so there used to be whaling, people used to hunt them for oils and for meat, which has basically been banned now, and their populations have been recovering. I believe the global population is now estimated to be about 10,000, even though they're still considered endangered. But there's still so many other threats to these guys, such as ocean noise from boats and things like that, that really affect the communication and can harm them. Ship strikes are another big issue. Entanglement in nets is another big issue. Pollutants in the water, microplastics get in these guys and can really hurt them. Uh, really ocean life in general, oil, and another big issue, climate change. Because these guys are s feed exclusively on krill. And krill like these cool areas, so they like to hide in the winter under and eat the uh, algae and stuff that grows under the ice in winter. So if there's no ice, there's no algae, there's no krill, that means no food for the whales, and the whales will starve. And luckily, these guys are also not too heavily predated naturally, but they are uh, preyed upon by killer whales. There have been record records of pods that have killed uh, adult killer whale, uh, not adult blue whales, which is really impressive to think about pods of them killing the largest animal on the planet. Just look how wonderfully big these guys are. How can you not love the whales? And also, they do suffer slight competition from other baleen whales, but they do niche partition since these guys primarily feed on Arctic krill. And there's enough krill to go around that pretty much everyone can eat them. So, the estimated population is from 2018 has been 5,000 to 15,000 individuals. They are still considered endangered under most uh, places, but they seem to be on the recovery because of human efforts, especially the great whales have probably made one of the greatest conservation recovery stories in the world. We all decided, nah, we're not going to hunt whales anymore, and they have pretty much done a good job at recovering, especially humpback whales. They can, can, you can barely consider them endangered anymore. So that's a testament to what we can do as a species, I think, and also a really, really good way to say if we want to change the world, if we want to fix climate change, we can do it. We can make big changes to help something that we love. And we love, obviously, we love eating, we love the planet. It's probably more than we love whales, even though you cannot love whales. You can't not love whales. I love these guys. But yeah, so yeah. I think this would be a great place to end the video. So, yeah. I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye